Hey everyone, welcome to Roll Call, the show where two childless millennials gush over an actor and follow this season's actor, actress Jennifer Lopez on her journey through her year, early years throughout her blockbuster hits and even take a few little pit stops in between on the way for some bonus mini eps, baby. Yes, because I still don't know what love is, so love question mark. Yes. <laughs> what is love? What is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Yes, today we have a special bonus, not so many episode as we like to call them. And the main focus on today's episode is going to be about Jennifer Lopez's 2011 album, Love? Question mark. And we're also going to uh, learn a little bit more about her uh, career at this time. We have a few articles to discuss, and Bria even has some things to talk about with Jennifer Lopez's book. Yes, which I borrowed from my local library online, (gasps) so Uh... I don't own this book. And so I'm trying to find, I just realized I was talking about that as well trying to find um if i can still see like my highlights and stuff from quotes so pardon me oh no problem and for that just goes to show everyone out there support your damn local library (laughs) psa now enter a psa about your (laughs) do 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 but usually these bonus episodes we start off with the music so should we talk about love what's love got to do with it baby yes um (laughs) love is a, a studio album released by jennifer lopez um it is her seventh studio album and it was released on april 29th 2011 by island records This uh, majority of her album was produced during the pregnancy of Jennifer's twins, Emmy and Max, and it was cited by Lopez, which I feel like we get this quote every time, Bria, her most personal album to date, taking inspiration from the birth of her twins and her own experiences with love. Well, I mean, I will say that I don't think that's a lie, and I think that's an attribute of a good slash possibly verging on great artists is that their current work is very personal and embodies what they're going through or like what's going on in their life or the world at the time so I think that's a bonus for JLo really not oh totally oh and I think yeah you're right the way I asked that probably sounded a little snarky but I think it's true and I totally agree what you say that we I don't think she's lying because every time you work on a new project or a new album or a piece of art or whatever a movie you know whatever you're trying to produce like most people who love what they do will feel really accomplished when they release something that they really love and so it's just funny like each time that we talk about um these albums that usually she has something similar to say. So I love that each time she releases a new album, she's been enjoying it. Yes. So, I mean, on on that note, <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about, like, the basics of the music industry, which is numbers and whatnot before we get into, like, the content of this album. Yes. And Bria made a fun game for this one, which we haven't done before when reviewing music. So I look forward to that segment. So Love was released April 29th of 2011. Simone, I don't know about you, but I was on the verge of going to college. Or I was in college, my bad. It's my (laughs) my freshman year of college. Mm -hmm. Um, And it debuted at number five on the Billboard Hot 200. This is J-Lo's sixth album to peak in the top 10 and highest since Rebirth. So two albums ago and five years 
or six years prior to 2011. And then it sold 350,000 copies in the United States, which is nothing to laugh at. But again, we're on this trajectory of uh, digital music becoming the top priority at that time. I don't I don't think Spotify existed. I'm not sure. I didn't have Spotify, but like Pandora was. Oh, popping. yeah. Yeah. You know, YouTube video streams were super important at that time, like having mm -hmm. a viral video. Um, I don't know if this is putting you on the spot, but like, what <laughs> were you listening to in 2011? Oh, totally not putting me on the spot at all. I can answer that question. Um, <laughs> that was a dumb response. Sorry. <laughs> But no, um, so 2011, I was on the verge of turning 21 in April. So I was like 20. I'm no longer a teen. Um, at this point in my life, I was, I had just moved back from Anaheim after living there for six months to do the Disney college program. So I'm so sorry. I'm just giving my like dumb little background. I'm like trying to like set the scene. And set no, the context, I mean, so. you have to put yourself there. <laughs> that could totally get cut, but I'm just thinking like, okay. All right. So I, so because I'll share the type of music I was listening to at the time and like the semi justification for it. So, you know, after moving back into my parents' house and then commuting that semester to SF state, taking BART every day, Bay Area rapper transportation for you non-locals out there. Um, I was just jamming away. I think I got my first iPhone that year. And so I had my iTunes at my fingertips and I was just jamming away to all the sad indie hits. I was just like truly in my feelings listening to Death Cab for Cutie and um, Bright Eyes and all of the like, sad girl on a train music i guess that you would <laughs> listen to sad girl on the b-a-r-t yeah <laughs> um for me i looked at my itunes which is a usually a pretty good reflection of what i was listening mm -hmm. to i was very much into curating my itunes by like when i added stuff so it'd be oh. like most recent and then go down through and then i had playlists for each year now it's all fucked up thanks to apple music but <laughs> <laughs> well like itunes is fine but my phone is all fucked up because mm. of apple music same but my 2011 um very much like this podcast i <sighs> took a deep dive into tony braxton's Disney oh Disney. And I was living my best life like it was like 1990. Like <laughs> I was so into Toni Braxton, and this was primarily sparked by her reality show. And I and I think probably being away from home, and you know, Toni Braxton's someone I remember hearing on the radio, and that my mom would kind of play. So probably like in a weird way, being homesick and like holding on to that and being like, I'm just going to listen to Tony Braxton all day, every day. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, um, but besides Tony Braxton, um, I also love indie music. And then we had some big hip hop heavyweights come out. But so like the temper trap was an album that I really liked, uh, that year Florence and the machine had just uh -huh. like came out. Um, I was listening to a little MGMT and stuff like that, mm -hmm. LMFAO from 2010 and stuff. Um, but Drake and Nicki Minaj's first album. Oh, like, my God. Yeah. I remember coming home from thanks or for Thanksgiving and my cousin had gotten us a ride with one of her friends. And so I tagged along and he was playing the Nicki Minaj album the whole time. <laughs> so like by way of that, I just like it just seeped into me and then I downloaded some Nicki Minaj <laughs> songs. <laughs> And um, so I'm sure like super bass and stuff like that. Um, yeah. I was really into Kings of Leon too at that time. Yeah. But also Beyonce's four came out in 2011. It came out that fall, but like, oh, I love that album. I think mm -hmm. it's one of her most underrated albums. But like, this is like a really big year for music. Like, yeah, for us to talk about this and I know that we were like super nostalgic about the 90s and super duper nostalgic about the early <laughs> aughts because yeah. it's like our coming of age. But like this is also where we really are shaping like the shit we don't want to listen to and the shit that we're like, 
yes this is like my shit i started listening to whole albums i mm. realized yeah i would agree with that yeah i realized i was only listening to singles and stuff from the radio and stuff and it's like you have like this you basically have a playlist for the year and you're like i don't even know if i really fuck with this artist because i've never listened <laughs> to their albums so mm -hmm. these are all albums that i listened to that year so um chef's kiss i'm not mad at 2011 i would i wouldn't mind going back no, yeah throw that away <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well i think too like you know of course different like genres of music always exist um and have a space to exist but i think what i think about in like you know the 90s and early mid aughts is that i my music taste was so eclectic mm -hmm. and that it was like one day I'm listening to In the Club, the next day I'm listening to Mr. Brightside, then the next day I'm listening to like No Doubt, and then the next day I'm listening to like it's just yeah all this different variety or Gwen Stefani or Panic at the Disco and that one day. And so now I think part of that too comes with getting older is that you still enjoy and hold space for different genres, but then you really start to like listen to whole albums of certain genres and you start to really realize like, oh, this is my shit. This is for me. Yeah, exactly. So funny enough, I don't think that this Jennifer Lopez album, it wasn't on my radar, really. I don't think I would have been like, oh, JLo dropped an album. I gotta go like download yeah. that. But in 2021, I'm I'm kind of here for it. So. I'm here for it too. And I have a lot to say on the matter when we get <laughs> to like the breakdown of the album. But I I mean, I know for sure her singles were everywhere. Like yes. I heard those a lot on the radio. But yeah, you're right. At that time in my life for my music career, or <laughs> just <laughs> not that time in my life, just in terms of listening to music, it wouldn't have been on my radar to like purchase the album. Yeah. So let's talk about the single. So the main single is On the Floor, which reached number three on the Billboard Hot 100. And then she had I'm Into You featuring Lil Wayne and mm -hmm. Poppy, which were moderate charting hits. And But they also topped the Dance Club songs um, chart, making for her 11th and I'm guessing 10th number one dance songs yeah which, i believe it yeah which all starts with waiting for tonight if you go all the way back so that's that's, that's always cool. that's the number one <laughs> well no i mean that was her first dance song oh that yeah she released so um in a weird way love is kind of taking it back to like something that she started out with um this album has like a really interesting origin story like you said she kind of took inspiration from having her babies and stuff but mm -hmm. she started recording when she was pregnant and so like this album didn't come out like relatively in a timely manner mm -hmm. um she started recording in 2009 and then it was supposed to be released actually around the time that the backup plan came out, which is interesting because mm. mm. I was like, oh, I wonder if she like wanted to do that or that's become like a strategy because of the wedding planner and the JLo album being like both number one at yeah. the same time. So um, it's interesting that it didn't come out with the black, yeah, the black up plan. Black it up. <laughs> It's interesting that it didn't come out with the backup plan, but, you know, I think it came out when it was supposed to, because I think 2011 is a really good time for this, like, music to come out. And even though it's, like, similar to Brave, I think that it's way better. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, and I think that probably giving it time and probably still working at it and recording new songs and getting rid of old songs really really helped mm -hmm. one of those old songs is Louboutins mm -hmm. which was supposed to be a single and didn't do that well she performed it on a few like um talk shows and stuff but w wasn't much interest so I'm glad she scrapped it <laughs> yeah me too yeah I I just I feel like it's just really repetitive and the it's not catchy in a good way well and considering that there were quite a other bit of songs on this album that were also really competitive i think a lot of that has to do with just being a, Dance, a club hit yeah. you don't you you don't want lyrics that are going to make you stop in the middle of the dance song and be like 
<laughs> oh damn! Although but I instead think, you're just like, <laughs> I think I'm blue. Baba Diva uh, <laughs> is really deep. Okay, so well, listen up. <laughs> Here's the story. <laughs> Um, but like the beat is fine and stuff, the but like fine. the the song itself is, eh. yeah. but um, but yeah. So also at this time, before the album comes out, she leaves Epic Records mm-hmm. and she moves to Island Def Jam. And I know that switching record labels is like usually a pretty big deal, um, but it was pretty amicable. But still, I think probably creatively, like it probably felt like a little like uh, like I hope that mm-hmm. this works out. Sometimes you switch labels and they don't even want the record that you like were working on. They're like, no, you have to scrap a whole project. Yeah, exactly. So um, the fact that love had been delayed before and then eventually came out on a different label props to her for getting that through there. Mm -hmm. Um, But I saw in an interview with DJ Ski that she chose to call the album love because love was something that still confused her. Ooh. And she said that love is the most confusing thing in the world. That's why the album is called Love with a question mark. So Ooh. I thought that was um, a great quote. Like, I was like, yes, I like that. It's definitely a song that has a bunch of like songs about love mm-hmm. and different types of love, phases of love and all thoughts about love. But it's not like a, it's not a it's not a this is me then type of love Song. It is not very, and it is not so much of an intimate album yeah. as this is me. Then, like you know, we talked about that before. I know this our that episode just got recently dropped, and and people have been listening to it and going back myself listening to it because I'm a narcissist and I love listening to my show. <laughs> um, how we talked just overall intimacy of that whole album. You feel like you're reading her journal, and it's almost like, oh, should I? <laughs> Should I be invited into this? Of <laughs> so, but yeah, I I think that's one reason why this album is just so fun because it's like it like there's some commentary on love, there's some commentary on getting stronger, growing older, growing wiser, but then there's just some like fucking bangers in there too. So I'm actually gonna throw it back to you because. Um, you boldly stated that this <laughs> is your favorite album so far on this journey of yeah. the deep dive. Mm-hmm. And I proudly am a This Is Me Then Stan fan lover. And um, I, I'm curious as to what makes you, I mean, listen to the This Is Me Then Benifer episode if you want to know why I love that album. But mm-hmm. I'm curious why you love this album more than that album j-lo on the six like i think because wow i okay you know how you say you think you start every sentences with uh on that note i I, that's my transition phrase i think well my transition phrase always starts with i think or (laughs) i think for me oh yeah i've i can hear that (laughs) <laughs> so you think for you i think for me this is my journey um okay so this album is serving me feelings that i greatly appreciate in the time that we're living in and that's why this is my favorite album so far now if we did this podcast three years ago pre pre March 2020 then my answer will probably be different March. but I think just mentally oh <laughs> like, <laughs> it's been so long I'm like I know like when, when did it start oh <laughs> uh, and we're only like a few months from 22 <laughs> anyways so we're still in the midst of a of the pandemic things have gotten better but in a lot of ways they haven't and there are days that are better than others and so we've talked about this before that movies directly after 9 11 were just so lighthearted be and didn't really need to make sense because that's probably just what america wanted for that time and that's how i currently feel about this album even though this was released in 2011 and it's 2021 now i feel like this is serving me just the I wanna dance. I'm just, 
I get, I, I have, I drive home in rush hour traffic in the morning and in the afternoon. And when we were prepping for this episode and listening to the album, this got me through some like poopy traffic on I-580 if you're a Bay Area local. So I don't know. I just really enjoyed it. And when we play our game later of play, pass, or repeat, the majority of my answers are repeat and play. (laughs) I don't have a lot of passes. Well, I think that's actually a great segue. I mean, I could counter why you love this album. Oh, I I would love to hear it. Please do. And I'm not countering it in terms of like being like, no, this is why this is me then is better. No, but no. This I'd is love to how hear your opinion. This is how I feel about this album. I think that honestly, that this is probably J Lo's strongest body of work, like overall. And I say that because even herself, like she said that vocally, this is like some of her better work. She after being with Mark and working with him on like Koma Unum hair and stuff like that, she got confidence in her voice. And like, even Mark was like, you know, you sound really good on this, like vocally. And I think that comes through on this album. I also think that that confidence comes through with the theme of the songs. Like they're all very strong, powerful songs i feel like for the most part mm-hmm. except for like the deluxe album like there's a reason <laughs> those songs probably didn't really make the regular album cut um mm-hmm. but i don't know i just feel like oh two man okay so i i strongly say that also because a big part for me like really fucking with an artist is like concerts and performance like mm-hmm. That is one reason I love Beyonce. I love Beyonce, but I don't listen to her all the time. Like, she's not someone that I constantly am listening to or, like, have on repeat and or, or like, where I had a Tony Braxton phrase where I legit will just listen to her, like, all day, every day for probably, like, a month or more. (laughs) I've never had that with Beyonce. I love her albums. I will listen to them when I am in those moods, but, like... Janet Jackson is someone I've also listened to like all day every day for like a span of time so anyways to say that I love her performance and that's what I really really love about Beyonce and that's what gets me excited about her because she's like the total package in that way Mm -hmm. and seeing Jennifer Lopez's concert tour footage for this album like I really feel like she found herself as a performer entertainer during this era she was having a lot of fun yeah, and, like, before, I think when we talked about um, maybe the J-Lo album, I I think we were watching, like, performances from then, and I was like, she doesn't really have, like, her stage presence down yet. Like, mm-hmm. she doesn't have, like, like, I think then I said, like, Janet has a saunter that, you know, she walks back and forth in between dancing. Um, Beyonce definitely has her own kind of strut and she's just very commanding on stage. Like she'll just like stare down the crowd and like, you know, um, but I think Jennifer Lopez finally found that during this era. And I think a big part of that is that she didn't tour before. Like that tour was her first tour. She did the let's get loud special, like mini show. Right. And then the only thing you would count would be like her guest appearances on, late yeah. night shows or VMAs. Yeah, Grammys. exactly. Yeah. And that Good does point. not make it a performer, really. And no. A traveling, <laughs> like a small traveling show just only performing your singles with limited stage yeah. capabilities. Agreed. That does not make a true performer. Yeah, so I think that this album, to me, it just really marks like her coming into her own as a singer-performer, that hmm. side of her. And I think... um I think that this album deserves that credit. Um, It's just emotionally, like, for one, this isn't my necessarily go-to type of music, and This Is Me then has more Mm -hmm. of that feel for me, so that's why I like that album a little bit more. But I gotta give credit where credit is due, and I think Love really is that girl that brought out the performer in J-Lo, and um, and yeah, that's, that's my thoughts on Love. So... On that note, <laughs> let's let's rate 
the songs from love with okay so we're gonna do a skip which is like uh like i don't really like this song that much if no one was like watching me or mm-hmm. i didn't have to listen for the sake of the podcast i would just be like eh, skip um play is like i like this song it's not bad i will listen to it but nothing that i'm gonna be like oh you gotta listen to this song mm-hmm. and then repeat is oh my god i love this song it gets stuck in my head run it back i want to hear it again mm-hmm. um type of song so yes um how do we want to do this do we want to go one at like one song one, at a time and then yeah. we each share our thing yeah we should have made signs <laughs> just like- i know like newlywed <laughs> games that would have been so fun or i was like we could try and say it at the same time but i think that would be an editing nightmare <laughs> All right, so let's go with On the Floor, Simone. What is your rating? Repeat, baby. Mine is play. I like On the Floor, but um, it's not like it's not a favorite song of mine from this album. Um, can I ask why you chose Repeat? It's a good single. It's a good smash. Um, I... I've never been a clubbing or like a club type of girl, but I do really like to dance. And so I have been to a few clubs in my youth, like (laughs) definitely not past the age of 25. I think that's when I stopped, but I do just really love to dance. And so in my like 21, 22, like 20s, this song would have been at the club and it just reminds me of being at the club. That's all. Just reminds me of dancing and having it's fun. It's Pitbull. It's Mr. 305. It is Mr. Life. Worldwide serving us. And <laughs> it is the spilt drink on my dress and the stiletto heels stabbing me and <laughs> the girls doing coke in the bathroom. It's great. Oh, my God. And at this time, it was probably like bandage dresses and like chunky oh, jewelry. It was. <laughs> oh, it was so chunky. It was. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and then your and hair's the thick, like heels with thick the thick heels, bottoms. And then the, the the like alternative girls who went to clubs definitely had feathers in their hair. It was almost like like a cute clubby Coachella look. I think tinsel was like <laughs> popping. Ombre had just maybe started. Chalk hair. Yeah. Oh my god. Mm. All right. <laughs> Anyways, okay. So when you say your rating, if you want to explain why, you can. I okay. won't ask you, so okay. we won't take up too much time. To- <laughs> two hours later. Um, all right, good head, number two. I am a repeat. <laughs> That's a repeat for me, too. I I love that song. That song gets stuck in my head. Um, I just want to shout out to someone I also fuck with a lot, Leah Rimini, who is mm-hmm. one of J-Lo's good friends. Yes. They did like some kind of Q&A about love and she was grilling her about like good hit and she's like you should release that as a single and like why am i not in your music video <laughs> like, well, if you did good hit as a single i would be in the music video <laughs> but um yeah i love good hit it's a song that got stuck in my head immediately yeah. upon listening so that is always like what i'm looking forward to when listening to um love so moving on Number three, I'm Into You featuring Lil Wayne. Uh, also repeat for me. All right, all right. It's a play for me. I think it's a good song. Um, I just, I I'm mean. Into you. I'm into you. <laughs> I feel like this was in a commercial or something. Like I'm sure, but to, again, serve the alternative emo girl in me, this sounds like the dance pop version of paramours i'm into you Ooh, it does and so i feel like the two songs <laughs> could kind of collide and be someone I, on I tiktok a should do a mashup yeah and uh give us our best lives yeah i like this song i'm not a huge a little wayne fan at this time i think he was still decent so i'm not mad at him being on this song um i think part of it is like when it, it's catchy Mm-hmm. But like when she was like, "You got me cooked with your love control," <laughs> it's a little, it's a little like. Um... Oh, the lyrics are like. <laughs> but see, I'm willing to look past the lyrics because I'm like, yeah, it's it's boppy and catchy. Yeah, it's a bop. It's, just, it's a bop. I'm not, I'm not running to get to that song. All right, so number four, it's a little kind of slower of a dance Ooh. song. What is love? 
I put this song on play. Okay. So not a repeat, but not not boring enough that it would get a pass or yes. a skip from me. Yeah, it's a play for me. I do like um I like the message in this song of like obviously we know J Lo has a pretty uh infamous dating history. So like, you know, she's really like, you know, I'm trying to figure it out. Fuck. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> the song and I think I think it's um it's well done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So number five, run the world. This is a repeat for me. Yeah, this is a repeat for me too. Like this gets stuck in my head and like that's not na 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 right. No. That's I'm into you. Oh shit. <laughs> Cut it. Don't even Cut know it. your album. No. I know, I know, no. I know, I know. No, I love could run the world. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, 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 run uh, the world. Uh, yeah. yeah. Run, run, run. Like, how does that not get stuck in your head? So good. And again, also reminds me of Who Run the World? Girls. Girls which was this year. So J Lo, you thief you. <laughs> Nye. No. Two great um, women think alike and they want to run the world. Yeah. Well, and it's different. Girls run the world and love running the world. Yes. And four came out after love. So anyways, um number five, run not oops, I just said that number five run the world. <laughs> number six, Poppy. Repeat, baby. It's a play for me. Like it's a bop, but um, yeah, I don't. I I feel like I think it was in the Fiat commercial, hence why the Fiat is in the music video. I really like oh, the music video. Okay. Um, I thought that was clever, and I thought it would have been a really great movie, actually. And it reminds me of Love Potion Number Nine, but um, but yeah, it. It's just it, I I don't want to hear this on repeat. So yeah, okay. sorry. That's fine. Movie about it. Movie about it. Dance. Like I can listen. I love it. But like, let's move on to. Um. All right. Anyways. Uh, Dance about it. Dance about it. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Number seven. Until it beats no more. This one was a play for me, but it almost got pass. Yeah. Um. If you don't know by now i'm not a big ballad person so yeah. this was like too slow for me but i like this song it's a play and i like the message of this song um and in her concert she performs this song and she has pictures of her kids and stuff and mm. so i really like that element of this song uh so i can't disrespect it and say skip it's not a skip i like the song so anyways um number eight one love this one is also a play for me it's a play for me i do really enjoy the um homage to her previous relationships in this song of course but i think she all it almost sounds like every album but it's that's a common trend with maybe not just female singers but you know like off the top of my head taylor swift right like there's i was gonna always, say you're a taylor yeah, swift fan how can yeah. you <laughs> there's like any just like every album pays some kind of homage to like previous loves but jennifer especially and i am raising my eyebrows hard as to like who could she be talking about it's very clear though she says like Fell in love with the bad boy on the block. Clearly, Diddy. That's P. Diddy. You know, yes. Dance. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I fell the... in... Right, right, right. Yeah. You're right. That's the one where she talks about all of her previous... Because I remember texting you about that, too. Yes. It's like, oh. It was pretty, um, I think, infamous, too, because in it, she says, like, when, for Ben's part, that she says, you know, kept the ring. And so a lot of people are like, oh, my God, she kept that, like, pink diamond engagement ring, which is not true. She's oh. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> my, fa my face just <laughs> fell at least five inches down. I was like smiling really, really, really wide. And then Bria was just like, that's not true. I was like, oh. 
<laughs> but um she said it sounds good in the song like mm. you know it makes her good music so as much as i love this is me then because i think it's like her journal i got it you gotta also keep in mind that yes these songs have like some truth to them but they also have to like sound decent so they might yeah. say some shit that might not be 100 percent true. true um true. but i like that song so it's a play for me um number nine invading my mind this one's also a play for me. This is my first skip. Okay. Is it my first skip? Yes. Um, I just think that this song is like anybody. I mean, anybody could sing any of these songs, but um, this really seems like a song that anybody could have sang, and you know, like it would have been fine. Yeah. So. It's catchy as hell, like, it does get stuck in your head, but it's not a song that I'm happy that gets stuck in my head, if that makes sense. No, that's right. But that's a good point. I didn't think about that, that some of these songs are, like, generic enough that anyone could have written this or sang it or put it on their album, and it just would make sense for whoever released it. Like, if Rihanna did this, if... Yeah, Lady Gaga. Lady Gaga did this. Be like, oh, yeah, yeah it's a Lady Gaga song. Like, I don't listen to this and be like, oh, this would have been better for for this artist or this person. Yeah. It's fine. Um, and that's, I mean, this album in general, I think, and I think for me, dance music is kind of like that in general. Like, it's mm. very, like this could be anybody um but that's because it's not a genre that i really fuck with heavy so i know you know when you love something you know the insides and outs and you're like oh no this dj uses this kind of and or whatever it is so um don't hate me if you love dance uh euro pop uh edm music or anything like that but you know for a casual listener it really can just be like I don't know who this is, but <laughs> I'm a dance to it. Like, <laughs> oh, definitely. And I think anyone who grew up uh, listening to the '90s boy bands kind of already automatically has a soft spot for Euro pop because so much of their early, like Backstreet Boys and NSYNC, of their earlier producers and stuff were like from Norway, Sweden, because they their sound was just so big and took really popularly to Europe. So they just keep that sound for where their biggest fan base lies. Yeah um so uh the next song is villain this is my first skip i thought it was boring yeah this is my second skip i i I don't really have much to say (laughs) yeah it's not i don't think it's a good song (laughs) but um yeah and then number 11 last but not least on the regular um version of love is starting over this is my next skip. Ooh. I think it's funny. I think you said this when um, we were talking about the album earlier before recording, maybe a couple of weeks ago, because it took us a while to kind of sync up schedules. But um, we, you were saying how like this album started off really strong and then just kind of like, eh. yeah, <laughs> queefed <laughs> at the end of it. And was just like, <laughs> just kind of stood up after all that dancing and just let some air out of its pussy (laughs) (laughs) do you want me to edit that out no (laughs) keeping that in (laughs) wow um (laughs) i mean i know what you mean (laughs) so it's, it's like oddly accurate in the weirdest way um (laughs) yes but i do love the message of starting over so i will give it a play um and for it being the last song there are definitely songs like and having like two skips before there's there are points where you're just like oh no i'm done with this album right Mm -hmm. but like this song i'll be like oh you know what it's cute i like it so Mm -hmm. Um, I want to give an honorable shout out to Take Care. I think okay. it should have replaced maybe Villain or something. Um, All it right. Was, yeah. It's on the deluxe album. It's got a more hip hoppy vibe to it. So I really fuck with it. Um, and I think, I I think didn't... it could have been a single too, honestly. But Oh, definitely. And I didn't give any of the deluxe extra four songs a skip. 
at all. I I either put them in repeat or play. I kind of really enjoy oh, it. Oh, do I you like... want to do those songs? I wasn't sure if you listened to them. Oh, yeah, I listened to the Deluxe album. Okay, so um, what, number 13 is Everybody's Girl? Or Hypnotico. Oh, right, my bad. I'm looking at the wrong thing. Okay, Hypnotico. I put Hypnotico on. Oh, wait, on... Oh. is Hypnotico on the regular version? Is it? Did I don't think... I don't think we talked about it. I'm not sure. It might be. Anyways, we're doing all of them. So Hypnotico. Okay. <laughs> I put Hypnotico on repeat. Okay. Um, it's a skip for me. Okay. I, it's too like repetitive. Yeah. But again, that's why I'm just like, mm, mm. and I've been <laughs> trying to. Hypnotico. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah. To, like Brie and I are fist pumping right now. Like we're in the Jersey Shore. And maybe that's why this album just works so well. Because <laughs> oh my we're God. In, like, the, that the was height like of height Jersey of Jersey Shore. Shore. Yes, it was. Oh my God. That makes so much sense. Okay. Being a, a Guido or a Guida <laughs> and just like orange face, duck lips. Here we go. Neon clothes and every neon skinny jeans and all. Von Dutch hat. Um, all right. Actually, it would have been Ed Hardy. You're right. Please. Yes. I'm so sorry, Von Dutch, Mr. Von Dutch. But Von Mr. Dutch Ed is Hattie. back and I'm so excited. Like, <laughs> Or if you were cool and you got one that said Von Bitch. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been you, probably. <laughs> probably, yeah. Um. All right, number okay. thir- 13, uh, Everybody's Girl. I put that on play. I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember it, so I'm going to say skip, but hold the phone. I just want to play, like, a little bit. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm going to stick with the skip. I don't okay. I don't remember it, so that's a bad sign. <laughs> there you go. Um, Charge Me Up, number 14. I put that one on repeat as well. Again, really? I, I, anything that I thought was just, like, a good club banger, I put on repeat. Okay. I don't remember this song either. It sounds like very 80s, like early 90s. Mm-hmm. Um, it, I'm going to stick with a skip since I don't remember it. So when I when, when you were saying that, <laughs> this album kind of uh, starts off very strong and then peters out in, <laughs> in a queef. Um, <laughs> in a queef. Uh, in a queef. Um, once I got to like villain, or actually once I got to invading my mind, I really like zoned out when i was listening to the album like i'd be like damn is it still playing like and then apple music does this thing where it'll continue playing random but kind of similar songs Mm. so um sometimes i'd be like is is this still love or like um oh damn i'm still like and i just probably would quit for most of the bonus songs yeah so um except sometimes oh go ahead no except for take care Okay, yeah, I would play. I play. I play daycare. That's a repeat for me. Okay, nice. I like it. And I, I think to that point, I, I that's why sometimes when I'm reviewing an album, <laughs> like I do that so much in my personal life. But I think ever since this podcast, and we have to listen to the album, I just try to do it on shuffle. You are uh, a mass murderer. I know. <laughs> why that is no there's a reason that albums are if you listen to lemonade on shuffle you're missing the whole fucking journey but this but but lemonade tells a story this album does not tell a story obviously obviously there are whole albums that i will listen to start from start to finish with at no shuffling at all but this album to me is one that you just put on shuffle because that way you can give everyone a try and not realize like, oh, is this from the beginning or is this from the end? Because to me, they're all like, no, 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 like they're all fun. Oh, you're so mad at me right now. I just, I feel like albums are in order for a reason and you have to take that into consideration when ranking or like, reviewing it out prime example drake just came out with certified lover boy i've seen people like oh if i like and i did this with rebirth i was like there's some songs that i feel like should have been like earlier like moved around a little bit and i feel like that plays a part in it like if 
there are songs that aren't in the right place or like Drake is infamous for this for me because like I'm supposed to cry and then turn up and then like what? So <laughs> like this album, fortunately, I do think you can put on shuffle and you're not going to run into any problems in terms of that. But I do think that the order of this album plays a role a little bit like there are there are more like messagey love songs in the beginning and then I feel like starting over being like an ending song is important like it's like definitely about starting over and like being tepid about like ending things but you know should I will I be better off and stuff like that I don't mean to preach to you or anything no but... and I, I don't do this to every album but for an album like this that just gives me my like Euro Club pop hits yeah I'm just I'm gonna put this one on on shuffle and I actually after your reaction I don't want to tell you the other album that I like listening to on shuffle because I feel like you're gonna not want to be my friend anymore <laughs> no. Uh, no it's too late go ahead say it Hot Fuss by the Killers. Um, I'm not mad at that being on shuffle. But, like, I I just don't... I wouldn't listen to an album the first time on shuffle. It was oh, like, no. No. Okay. I thought that's what... Oh! No, 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 no. I listened to this album twice from start to finish. Okay. And I put it on shuffle to really test these are the ones that I'm... I'm into it, like, so that I can decide if I would really like this song or really not, because I feel like, and I did that with all of her other albums, because of okay. course we all know and love her singles, but I wanted to make sure that I was truly giving the other songs a chance too. And okay, that is totally fair. But like people do listen to albums on shuffle the first time and those people are fucking serial killers. Like Correct. I, 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 the court allows that one. I agree with you. <laughs> I agree with you there. Like, uh what? But um but yeah, okay, so whew. Got all worked up a little bit for <laughs> for nothing. We, for nothing. we almost were not friends anymore. <laughs> um. All right. So, any last thoughts on the Love album? Did you watch any performances or videos that we want to talk about? No, not necessarily. I watched the music videos. Um, and I know, but I know you watched the concert footage. Um, kind of in more depth. Did you have a favorite part from that concert footage? Oh my God. I, I did rant about the concert for the footage. Um, okay, it's 521. If I go over 10 minutes. Okay. Um, so the concert is called the Dance Again World Tour. I watched it on Tubi, which it's free. So if you want to do that, hopefully it's free by the time this releases. <laughs> um, still. And I found it on YouTube, too. So also, if you're incapable then youtube somebody spliced together some fan footage and it wasn't half bad when mm -hmm. i rewatched the like put together dvd kind of special um i was like oh i saw like a good portion of this or like there wasn't much missing and the fan footage they actually included the um like the videos for like when she's doing an outfit change and stuff and you know it's an interlude and stuff so that was in there Whereas the DVD special, some of those, a lot of those weren't in there. So I'm glad Aww. I watched the fan footage because some of those were like some of my favorite moments. So the nice. intro really, like I love the intro. Um, the intro is like her and it's like she's backstage and she's like at her vanity and she looks very Hollywood glam. And in her book, she talks about this and it, like the segmentation of the concert too like also she's the creative director i think of her concert so like this is all oh, of her idea that's impressive yeah so it was very intentional and i really really like that like how she broke it up into different like segments and stuff to like do different songs and whatnot and i thought that was great so the beginning is like this old hollywood feel there's uh, male dancers in top hats and stuff like that um fuck i'm trying to think of this song that she comes out to 
which I had looked up um, her set list, but I failed to keep it open. Dance again, world tour. Um. Oh, okay, yes. All right, so in that intro video is the song Never Gonna Give Up, which mm -hmm. I really liked that song previously, and I think it's like, so beautiful and it's like all whimsical sounding um and then she comes out and she has a like this kind of furry top hat thing and she's like hello lovers and it's very like <laughs> glam but so she plays get right then she goes into love don't cost a thing and then she does like i'm into you and waiting for tonight and then um i think there's another video break and she does louboutins um mm -hmm. which mm, why i will say that i was surprised that you she just can't let it go <laughs> <laughs> i will say i was surprised that she um got like love don't cost a thing like out of the way so fast because i wasn't expecting it to be that early in the concert like i was just yeah. like oh damn yeah, like you would maybe put play instead and save my love don't cost a thing for later. I did. I don't know. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I don't. I just, you know, I think that's a really big song for her. So it was kind of surprising that it was. And it wasn't the intro song, which like, you know, sometimes it's like you do a big hit song in the beginning to get like the crowd hype. And then you mm -hmm. also do a big closing song, you know, to you know send them off nicely but um it was like smack dab number two so i was a little like oh damn love don't cost a thing already um <laughs> i will say too i think her choreography improved greatly from the let's get loud concert and even like again her guest appearances on stuff like interesting because she was a dancer first so what like what makes you say that i just i think that I think it's the overall, not necessarily like J Lo as a dancer, because I feel I feel like she has like some iconic choreography, but like it's like not as much as like other people I really like. Like there are there's Janet videos I can think of and like immediately be like, Oh, like this move or Aaliyah videos or Beyonce videos that I could think of. And I'm like, Oh man, when she did this move, like, like Aaliyah's <laughs> um, self-titled album is now available for streaming. So, you know, people love that. And like the more than a woman video, people were talking about how that's like really underrated. And like when she does the move with the towel between the legs or like there's this part where like they like rub their arm. I don't know. There's like parts that stick out to you, you know, when okay. you watch something enough. And there's very few things from JLo videos that stick out to me choreography wise like that, where it's like ingrained in my head. Oh, she's going to do this next. Yeah. And I think that she has stronger choreography this time around. And I think her dancers look like really cohesive too. With okay. her boyfriend, Bo, Casper mm -hmm. Smart, is, like, I believe he choreographed, or he's, like, in charge a lot of choreography then, so props to him, I guess. But anyways, um, <laughs> so the next segment, she has, like, this, like, boxing ring set up, and the guys are in, like, uh, boxing clothes, and she's, like, very, like um new york bronx stuff after that so she starts off with going in which i don't know where that song is from um i think it's with flow rider but oh, um like like she guessed it on that song you think i'm not sure i don't know if if i we've listened to all her albums up to this point so i don't know if it was a single or what but um yeah i think it's a single but so she starts off with that song and she talks about like you know when you get knocked down you got to get back up and i thought that was like a good message like way to play with that theme of the boxing ring and stuff yeah and yeah she goes into a medley of like her murder ink hits with i'm real all I have, feeling so good, ain't it funny, Jenny from the block, all that kind of Bronx, like J-Lo stuff that we mm -hmm. have grown to love. And then she has another video segment for another change, and it's to Baby I Love You from This Ooh. Is Me Then. And it's her and Casper, and they're doing kind of like this interpretive 
dance like and they're sitting and like the salty person in me was just like I know that the song is like about Ben so <laughs> the fact that you're doing she's this she's dancing with another man <laughs> yeah the fact that you're doing this with your new boyfriend like uh, okay whatever um it was cute though I guess and then Ben had real sad puppy energy that night <laughs> it was bummed <laughs> yeah so this section I really really like because it's like her funky section which is like uh, yeah so she has on like this blue outfit it's very like kind of motowny which also makes me like understand why she wanted to do the motel trip yeah 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 um but she at one point she has like um her dancers where she's like no i can't like james brown like i can't go on and they drape like a cape over her and she's like it's not over till i say it's over and she throws it off and she like keeps dancing and stuff and i'm just like yes get it girl um so according to set list fm um in this section you know she starts out with hold it don't drop it um then there's like oh she sings starting over and then she sings i'm glad and um secretly i feel like secretly was like uh oh maybe okay maybe this is wrong i think this is wrong she sings hold it don't drop it and then she sings some other stuff i forget but because starting over i'm glad and secretly are another video change thing so yeah i'm sorry i don't remember what um other i want to say hold it don't drop it um oh there's another song. You're doing like... so good, though, remembering this whole thing. I mean, I kind of asked you this on the fly, too. Yeah, I should have took notes. But, okay, so I really like that section. I'm mad that I don't remember, so by all means, my bad. Um, I love Secretly, so when I heard, and I love I'm Glad, so when I heard I'm Glad and Secretly, <laughs> like, spliced together, I was like, oh. <laughs> and so I was just like, oh, give me more of that. Anyways, um, <laughs> I'm probably going to cut all of this because I'm not going to like no. listening to myself. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's interesting. Like, I'm I'm sorry that I didn't watch it, but I, um, I'm, and I know that like no one asked you especially particularly, or blah, 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 particularly to do it, but I just know that that's what you chose to do on Friday and I appreciate you and I adore you and love you for that um it wasn't hard but <laughs> it's enjoyable i felt like i was i got up a few times like and was dancing especially during um like the latin part i was like doing a little salsa um did she but, do any selena songs yes so she performed um no me queda mas mm -hmm. and i was just like ah yes um which i wasn't expecting but i think that's amazing that she always kind of finds a way to tribute selena so far in her concerts mm -hmm. um and then so this next section um she's in this beautiful blue dress and uh this is like the slow down section of the concert and so she does an acoustic version of if you had my love which I oh, was like, oh yeah, I did fan. watch that one. That one was very yes. unique. Yes, I was fangirling over. I was like, I did not know I needed this in my life. <laughs> Why is this not like on an like a single like from the concert? Like, uh, give it to or, me. Yeah, or just like re-released as a like bonus track or something. Yes. Oh my god, I loved it. And again, for all you people who think that Jennifer Lopez cannot sing. More proof. Yes. Um, I should just compile a list of <laughs> things like proof J-Lo can actually sing. She may not have the voice you like or want, but she can yes. hold a note. She um, can. Definitely better than me, for sure. So that's, <laughs> that is saying a lot. Um, and then she sings Until It Beats No More. And again, like I said, she has like a montage of uh -huh. an Emmy behind her. Her coconuts, which is cute. And mm -hmm. um, some like home photos of them and her and then another i think this is just a dance interlude it says so another outfit change and stuff 
and then she uh, comes out and she's like Ricky Ricardo. She's like in this like little like tux with the ruffles and stuff. And I think she has on a hat and she like comes out playing the bongos or I'm sorry if I'm fucking up the drum name. Um, but she comes out playing the drums. Yeah. And that impressed me because I was like, who knew J Lo could play the drums? Like All right. A little beat. Um and so she's like orchestrating like this like kind of very Latin like theater um big band section. Okay. And so she um starts out like that and then it goes into let's get loud which i think is like an amazing way to start mm-hmm. that off because it's like it's really like get the party started hell yeah and then um poppy is next i guess and then on the floor is um her last and then her encore is dance again which fits because it's the dance again world tour mm-hmm. and chef's kiss I am sad that I did not know of this album, this tour at this time. I wish I could go back in time and see it, which is like the only real way I would really desire to use time travel is like entertainment purposes because I don't believe that I could be trusted to like fix anything. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But you will catch me at some concerts, uh, maybe at some like movie openings (laughs) like... (laughs) But um, but yeah, so I re- I really enjoyed it. I I suggested I would give it a four pumps of butter. You know, highly. Oh no shit, highly... that's pretty good. Yeah, and I don't take my concert DVDs lightly. Okay, like <laughs> so. So that is some heavy butter for this. All right. Popcorn. All right. Um, I also had a few drinks, so that probably played a role. Well, whatever. <laughs> um. So you yeah. know what they say? What is it like? A drunk heart speaks a sober mind. And I only went fourteen minutes over, so or fifteen. So see, no. I'm not. I'm not ever gonna cut you off. Don't ever ask me to keep time because I'm not gonna. be I like... will cut myself out of this fucking thing. Okay. So okay. anyway, <laughs> um, I guess also I get to talk about the book, or we can talk about something we both can talk about before that. So you want to talk about SNL? Oh, sure. So um, Jennifer does another guest appearance on Saturday Night Live. Um, the major- Not the majority, but there's a good handful of people that are still part of the cast. Um, she does kind of kind of some more like similar things that she had done on the show in the past but one episode was a really good one where she runs a gold jewelry store called hoops and i didn't see that did Did you did you you watch the right snl episode oh wait are you talking about the one where she was doing the steering wheel one where it was like meet me the different okay 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 so she's hosted snl three times yes Okay, so I'm. Let's go for the middle one then. All right, cut out. What yes, I said that's before. what Arrow. <laughs> I'm like, did I? I watched the whole episode. I'm like, did I miss that? Okay, hoops <laughs> comes later. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Do you want to talk about SNL? Sure, I'll talk about my favorite skit from that one, which is a uh, the shoot hold on i gotta look up her name really quickly um her name actually starts with jenny it's jenny um she got cut from the show after this season like recently um jenny slate is her name yeah uh no she got cut after that season so she Um. accidentally had a mix-up um where she was saying something her like character used the word frickin a lot um as in trying to say fucking the f word Mm -hmm. and she just like let it slip and said the f word on live air and they didn't catch it or correct it and since she was like in her probation year that year as a cast member they kind of let her go Wow, that is kind of a lame reason. To Which sucks. But for those who know Jenny Slate, they know her to be an, a really funny character. She did release a special on um, Netflix, a comedy stand-up special. She also is Mona Lisa from Parks and Rec 
uh, don't be suspicious, don't be suspicious. Um, and then she does a lot of um, sketch comedy with Nick Kroll. Um, and anyways, my favorite sketch from that one, and Jenny Slate had this kind of as a recurring skit, uh, skit throughout the year, um, but it's like different sounds that steering wheels can make. And it's all just like, meet me, what? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And Jennifer played her like sister sidekick or whatever for the shop owner. And um, th that is one of those skets, sketches slash skits. I keep on marrying the two words, but that's a skit that I will go back and watch every now and again. Same with hoops, but we'll save that for, we'll save ho hoops for later. Okay. Um, this episode, I did not like as much as her first one. I have yeah. not seen her last one, so we will be surprised when we get there um i also it also bothered me that i feel like a lot of her the skits with jennifer lopez were very latin driven and yeah. i was just like homegirl is and can be as big ambiguous as hell in movies and stuff why would they pigeonhole her on snl to just doing like you be the latina like mm -hmm. And I noticed that that was kind of the trend, even when she first hosted, right? Maybe, but I don't think it was so overt. Like, like she, obviously, the steering wheel one, um, she has, like, kind of a Bronx S accent, and she, yeah. she's, like, in a denim romper-looking thing, very J-Lo of mm. 20, mm -hmm. 2001, not 20, um, 2001, um, and then, but, like, the, the Olympic one where she's commentating on the Winter oh, Olympics, and yes. they're just, like, oh, like, who wants to be in snow, you know, it's, it's, like sunshine and beaches other places like why would you want to live there <laughs> or like oh that sounds gross or like yeah. they just don't fuck with the winter olympics and that was like interesting but it was also i think it bothered me too because i felt like it was putting other cast members in that position of playing someone latinx and they're not and like i feel like if beyonce came on this is always going to be my go-to, I guess. <laughs> if Rihanna came on SNL, it wouldn't be like, okay, now, Jenny Slate, you get to be, like, a black girl, like, so that we can do black skits with Rihanna. Like, no. Mm, okay. And I, and I feel like that's, like, what bothered me about it. Again, this is, like, 10 years ago. So, again, we weren't as, like, PC and cognizant about people of color stuff but yeah snl had a long way to go i think keenan was the only black cast member at that time i'm trying to remember who else was on there with him but um i think so i think maya rudolph had left by then i don't know if fred armiston is like mixed or not but he i know he speaks spanish really fluently so oh, okay well i think so he's he like was mean like yeah he's some He's somewhere, I think, from South America. Okay, so maybe he had a right to be in this. Argentinian, case. maybe? Um, but, like, um, oh, I did, like, the tele... I think my favorite would be the, like, telenovela one where she's, like... Oh, nine. yes. And I just thought that was funny, like, mostly when they did, like, the intro, like, where they flash to, like, where it says the name of the telenovela. It's, like, Bezos E... Um, kisses and tears in spanish oh but, yeah, yeah 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 and like they flash to like the intro credits and like their hair's blowing and they're yeah. like, posing and stuff yes yeah and, that one was funny yeah and Kristen wig was really funny in that that's the one where she like dumps the powder <laughs> yeah <laughs> and is like, trying to poison drug. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um i thought that was funny um and then the other one I didn't really care for was it was Kristen Wiig and um, Bill H Hedder, and they were like entertainment hosts. Oh, they've it, done that one a lot where they like interview the person as the actual person, and then yeah. they have these like crazy reactions of like it's a lot of physical comedy. Bill Hader will like spit his drink or spill his drink or dump something on Kristen Wiig. Yeah, 
I I just again didn't like it because it was leaning so much on like you're Latin and so like the one of the jokes was like oh speak Spanish like yes that's good like because we want you to look like that you know Mm -hmm. and then um they're like yeah like more Spanish and like so JLo speaks like she's just like okay and she just amps it up and so they cut that and they put that in like their teaser for their show where they're like and they put like different subtitles over it to make it seem like she's crazy taken out of context yeah so like I think that's funny but then like like the Spanish side of them just like oh, I was like that's okay <laughs> like, yeah. but the taken out of context part was the funny part to me but not so much mm-hmm. like ooh speak Spanish all crazy like I was just like okay mm. like no one thinks JLo is crazy <laughs> like You're right well somebody does but <laughs> not yeah. us not um, us and then her performances for this one she hosted and performed Mm -hmm. So this is her second time doing both. And uh, she sang Till It Beats No More and fuck what was the other I think starting over. So she chose like two really slow songs, which again, if you think she can't sing. And I think she's singing live for these performances. Yes. It was not no Ashley Simpson deal. No, yes. Oh, and that's one of the things I sent you from the concert footage was like Uh her rehearsing kind of with her backup singers and her vocal person for her tour Mm -hmm. and they were trying to harmonize and you know she like again you can hear her singing and even her vocal person was like you know you always try to like slow it down a little she's like you know i'm the queen of just slowing it down so Mm -hmm. i just feel like the vocal stuff and this is probably a good segue into the book is just like something that JLo is very self-aware about. She knows she's not the strongest vocalist. And she said it numerous times. I've read it, heard it, seen it numerous times at this point. Mm -hmm. So when haters say that, it really ruffles my fucking feathers. Because I'm just like, find something else to like hate on her about. Because when, and that's the beauty of being self-aware. It's like when you know your flaws, like, I think she said that, like, she's like, I know singing is like my biggest flaw. Like, it's mm-hmm. not my strong suit. And, um, but it's something I, you know, try to work on. But when you know that, like, people can't hold that against you. And so I think it's funny that people harp on that with her because it's like, she knows that. As if not- she's not self-aware about it. Yeah, she knows that, so you're really not hurting her because, like, she's already addressed it to herself. But I wonder if there's a part of her who would have more faith in herself, more confidence in herself, if she wasn't getting that kind of pushback and feedback from people. Like, I wonder if there is a little small bit of it that makes her, that adds to her feeling a little self-conscious about it. I mean... Or if she's pitting herself against someone else, probably. Yeah, I mean... At this point, I think <laughs> JLo, I don't know how much more fucking confidence you want to give her. <laughs> because, I mean, if we're talking about strictly singing, like, of course, she probably would love to feel more confident. And I think she got there with love. I don't think she's not confident. And I think that's why she performs a shit ton more than she did before, like, because she really found that side of herself. But, um, all right. But, yeah, I mean, if she had, like, a fucking blowout voice, like, you think the diva rumors are bad now? Like, (laughs) if she really could compete with Mariah Carey? Like, yeah, no. And that's why singing is probably not her strong suit in love because you can't be perfect. Like, she would be perfect at that point. That's true. She wouldn't have a flaw. Like, Mariah Carey (laughs) can sing, but she's kind of a shit dancer like she doesn't really move around oh yeah no people move around her but she doesn't <laughs> move around. but um but yeah so i well, don't know to, why i brought that up but well i think too to oh my god there there it goes again to wrap that segment up when talking about the how self-aware she actually is yeah about her her singing i think 
it would be a good time to talk about maybe some of the things that she brings up in her book and to quote uh there is for those and to also talk about this amazing vanity fair article mm -hmm. written in september 2011 bria sent this to me and it was a dish it's a really really <laughs> good read it's by lisa robinson and jessica dial um, and it has this gorgeous photography by mario testino and the second paragraph says, Jennifer Lopez is a complex woman. She's been a wife three times, a mother, an actress, a singer, a dancer, a television personality, a fashion designer, mogul, a brand. Her eight albums and numerous hit singles have sold a combined total of 55 million copies and her latest dance hit on the floor has generated 3 million digital downloads. And then it just goes on to like gush over it. But I think it's it's important to to realize when you're talking about someone like Jennifer Lopez, she has a lot of things happening mm -hmm. in her life. And she's not just a singer entertainer. She does a lot of other things, oh, which yeah. I hope she talks about in her book. Not so much. I mean, this book is not, <laughs> this book isn't a tell all. It's not a story of her life and every like era and journey from beginning to then. Um, it's very much a specific point in her life, which is this era of this love album, this tour, not her getting right. a divorce. Um, also in the Vanity Fair article, she says, this is why I was like, I've seen this multiple times. So she said in the uh, concert doc, but she also says in this article that she says, you know, um, when I, the article says, when I asked Jennifer what she considers her greatest talent, she says, I think I'm a really great performer. I think I'm a really great actress. I feel confident in those things. That's a better way to say it. I'm not as gifted a vocalist as some of the other girls that are out there, but I know I communicate. When I think of great vocalists, I think of Mark, of Luther Vandross, of Whitney Houston, but Mark has helped me a lot with this. He always said I had a beautiful voice and that it was better than I thought it was. Aww. And um, I just, like, again, she's self-aware. She knows she's not Whitney Houston, but, like, I think an important part of that too is like i've seen a clip of her and mark doing their reality show and he's talking and she's like you know sometimes it's not the biggest voice sometimes someone with a soft voice can really get it across better and i think that's true especially like sometimes with pop music and stuff like that um but like when she says she knows how to communicate that's the part that i like when someone on twitter was like oh well she's an actress pretending to be a singer that's like exactly what i was like that's not a negative because she knows how to communicate her music and stuff and get like the story and all that stuff the visual mm -hmm. all that stuff and bring it to life and not everyone can do that like not and <laughs> watching the vmas last night for one i'm too old now i registered <laughs> that i checked out i was like look are these are the people I want to see on YouTube? Okay, I'm going to watch their performances on YouTube and then I'm going to bed. I'm not sitting through all this. Like, because <laughs> I just feel like this generation, they can't perform. Like, it's not entertaining at all. It's like so boring. <laughs> and I was having just watched her concert footage. I was inter like, she's an entertainer. So, um, communicating that it's a huge part of that and there's beautiful voices okay sean mendez has mm. a great voice this little performance was boring as hell like you know <laughs> this can totally get cut but i agree with you 100 percent. and i don't know if it's like can we bitch general... about the vmas for a oh, bit <laughs> totally we can and just to attest to your comment about how artists are really boring like they might produce like decent music or whatever but they have no stage presence and i i wonder too you know previously in our generations or before before millennials we had the gen xers who were enjoying 
some really banger songs in the 80s. We got 80s hair band. We got heavy rock. We got fun. Like, start of hip hop. Like, start of hip hop. Madonna. Madonna. Like, Michael you know, Jackson. New Janet kids on the block. Yes. Thank you. And the, we have a lot of just really huge stage performers and fun music before then. If you're talking about 60s and 70s, you're talking about a lot of live music, live performers um, with the Beatles and Jimi Hendrix and these Motown. huge Motown, these huge stage personalities, Chuck Berry, like all of these huge, huge, Little huge. Little Richard, like yes, thank you. Yeah, that's yeah. Like huge stage presence, huge yeah. like tiny person, huge stage personality. Prince, like here we go. 90s we get dance groups more unified groups um where their vocals may not be like 100 percent, but damn they are dancing in sync both <laughs> pun intended not intended and um and i've just noticed and i don't know if it's just me trying not to <laughs> shit on like gen z music but like when i first watched one direction i was like they're boring like they just stand there they don't do anything like learn some fucking dance moves and that's why i like k-pop like k-pop at least they like yeah. can do some stuff but if you're just sitting up there standing or sitting up there standing it's an oxymoron but if you're just <laughs> up on the stage standing or you're only playing a musical instrument, but you're not like Lady Gaga, who's like upside down on the piano, like trying to at least give some kind of a show. Yeah. Yes. So, oh my God, I've been thinking about this all day and I've been on Twitter all day, like seeing people's opinions and why um, it was so lackluster kind of last night. And I have a couple of theories. Um, I think that... We have to acknowledge, again, like we said before, digital music. I feel like it plays a big part of this. And just the expansion of online, okay? We have people that were discovered online. We have people who, you know, are big and started out indie and, like, just got traction and stuff. And a huge part missing in that streamline of, like, it's easier to, like, find a fan base and like you know become something more get discovered is a and r or not a and r um artist development and like when i think of that i think of like <sighs> beyonce when she was a child and you know growing up this is, was her dream to be a performer so her parents really you know we're like okay you're gonna do this we're gonna do this and they had like a boot camp and like her dad would make them run and sing so that's why she has incredible stamina on the stage of like being able to sing and dance when you look at in sync there's footage of them in a fucking warehouse in florida with no yeah and it's hot as no shit. ac dancing their asses off just over and over and over again you look at new edition same thing they were like a big part of that when you watch the temptations movie they were practice like they were like we can sound great but if we don't look cool this shit don't matter like and that oh i know i mean i'm honestly we're 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 about an hour and a half in on this episode and you have yet to talk about the book so if you're ready i would love to because that's how we got sidetracked yes. was we read the van i read the quote from vanity fair and um yes Jennifer Lopez, very self-aware. Again, she has mentioned this several times. Um, but the self-aware part. So this book, it talks about love a lot. And um, I think this was probably very cathartic for her to write about her journeys in love and her revelations I think probably as she was separating and divorcing from Mark Anthony. Mm -hmm. So um, there was just a lot of things in there that I don't have my exact like highlights and stuff, but you know that I was surprised to see her, you know, talk about like how she didn't really like value herself and that like being in relationships for her a lot of time is like about the other person and not so much like is this good enough for me and stuff like that and again to 
go back to like her confidence, like for someone who looks like she does and has so much success and, you know, is pretty good at like, um, she's a multi hyphenate entertainer, Mm -hmm. like not even entertainer, just a multi hyphenate because she has like fucking perfumes and (laughs) shit, JLo beauty and stuff like that. Um, and clothing lines she had, but to see someone like that write about like how, they didn't love themselves enough and like that their relationships suffered because of that like is I think humbling in a way um but I've had a few moments in my life where like you know you go through something bad and to get out of it you kind of have to like really study and well for me at least study and you know recognize like the things that maybe you were didn't have boundaries for didn't um put a stop to or speak up about or you know things that you let slide and um not being true to yourself or like trying to people please and stuff like that and and really taking like command of like you know I have to if I'm not happy, then, you know, it doesn't, nothing else really works. Like, I can try to, like, you know, make my husband as happy as possible. But, you know, at the end of the day, if I'm not making myself happy, then I can't rely on him to just, you know, wind up doing that. And I think I stole that from Will Smith. <laughs> like, oh, he's talked about, like, how... um like how it's not his job to make like Jada happy or it's not Jada's job to make his ha- him happy. It's their jobs to make themselves happy and then come together and share that happiness together. And um, I think that's important, like, because I think a lot of people get into relationships for some, some of those reasons, like to feel validated in some kind of way, like, okay, someone loves me enough that they're putting up with my shenanigans so great I'm a good person or like Mm -hmm. I'm desirable and I think JLo has said that you know a lot of her relationships she wants to always be with somebody like she doesn't like being alone and like she thought like getting married that she would always have someone there and that's not true you know especially in her career because she travels she's on sets She's dated people who are in similar careers, so they're on tours or they're off on retreats with their (laughs) labels or, you know, stuff or on sets themselves. And, you know, marriage is not an immediate, like, okay, we're always together and, like, I always have a companion. And nobody wants to, like, even in friendships, like, you don't want to feel like you have to entertain somebody. Like, you know, like, okay, like, you happy now like but yeah I, I I really liked her book in terms of that I was again I wasn't reading it thinking it was going to be some memoir where we get like the lost love letters from Ben Affleck or she like really talks about like why they broke Got up it. and like what tore them apart and what it was like canceling the wedding and like just... would you say sorry to cut you off no go ahead go ahead would you say that this that the vanity fair article is almost more juicy than her book um no i think the vanity fair article is like a good taste of what her book is like like i think they're pretty similar um what do you find juicy about the vanity fair article um, I don't know. It just felt like intimate in that the journalists who were interviewing her, like this spanned a long time. Like it wasn't just one sit down interview that they did. Yeah. It was like over, over several different visits. Like it was definitely an editorial thing. It was not a small interview. So I don't know. I just, I thought that it, she talked a lot about her personal life and, but I didn't, I didn't read the book, so. I think J-Lo is, like, one of the last of the old kind of celebrity of, like, she'll give you just enough, you know? Mm-hmm. But, like, 
And I think she had to learn from Benifer that, like, I can't share every fucking thing. Like, the way she was in, like, the Pat O'Brien interview and with Diane Sawyer, she was very, very open. Like, and, like, even now her and Ben seem to have, are very much like, I'm not talking about Jennifer. I'm not talking about Ben. Like, they won't. Yeah, that's true. They're definitely seen a lot together, but they're not talking a lot about each other, I guess. Yeah. And so I think that, like, she's good at, like, sharing enough stuff, but it, I think she's gotten better at, like, holding back enough, too, for herself. And I think being with Mark really helped that. But I think, too, in the book, she, like, says, you know, I really lost myself. Like, I didn't, I think she really, like, I think being with Mark and, like, he's, like, pretty private, living in New Jersey or New York, Long Island or wherever they lived, like, not going out as much and stuff, and then eventually having kids, like, she t took a lot of time off, and she wasn't, like, doing what she was doing, and I think before, and which is, like, juggling a lot of stuff, and I think that a big thing for her is like she's a workaholic and I think that's part of who she is and I think anybody who's in a relationship with her has to kind of love that part of her as well because I think that's where she thrives really okay. like look at her now like someone on Twitter was like you know Jayla's just doing a promo tour for nothing but herself and I'm absolutely here for it and that's true <laughs> she right. doesn't have anything to promote right now but she is like all over the place and you rarely see that like anymore with ce celebrities of her caliber and her age mm. um but yeah I, I I do think that she lost herself a bit like in her marriage and you know I think she really like wanted to make her marriage work in the dance again DVD they touch on their divorce a little bit and like her dad you know it's like you know she really wanted to get this right and people who like want to bring up oh well she's been married two times before and stuff she knows that like and she what no yeah and she knows that and i think with mark like especially with the way that her and ben ended before like i think with mark she really really was like i really want to make this work like i want to do the work that is required and i think in her marriages before i don't think she was in that place and i think ohani has said that um and i'm not chris judd has been relatively nice but like you know where they're just like she gives up she doesn't want to do like the hard stuff and i think with mark she did do the hard stuff but it was wearing on her and not necessarily allowing her to be her best self either and i think it's interesting too because we haven't talked about this but coming out of or prior to getting a divorce she does american idol and yeah. in the tour uh D tour dvd footage whatever um she talks about like how that was really a really big moment for her because that really helped her for one it gave people a different viewpoint of her like people were able to see like this non super diva jlo and you know she's cried on idol and people were able to see like a softer real version of her i guess more vulnerable yeah. uh, vulnerable version of her and... I see her as a coach too, someone who has enough experience in the business and industry to be able to ad adequately coach and like help people form their careers. Yeah, but like you know, she was really popular on American Idol when she, she did was. That. I liked like... watching her with it. She worked really well with um... <sighs> Randy, Steven Tyler. Yes, thank you, Steven Tyler. They were they were funny together. Yeah. I liked her a lot. But, like, so that gave her career another jump start, which she really needed. But at the same time, like, I feel like it's, like, when you stop doing something and then you start doing it again and you're, like, I realize why I do this because I really love this and this is, like, where I'm supposed to be and this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And I think that American Idol was that for her. And then on top of it, you know, she makes the Love album, On the Floor in Love, um mm. on the floor and american idol coincide like and so it was just like off to the races from there 
I don't know. I just, I feel like I'm just rambling about the book, but I think the book is, a, I think it does a great job of showing her being self-reflective and self-aware and, um, um, I like that we kind of just kind of kept it to music and books and her, which this is, this is her show, at least for season one. So we're going to keep it at that. But either way, y'all, speaking of mess, this is, of course, an unscripted, unofficial episode. Well, it's still official. We're going to fucking publish it. But on that note, if you like us enough to, if, if you don't think we are too much of a hot mess, rate review subscribe follow us on roll call pod that's r-o-l-e-c-a-l-l-p-o-d on all of our (laughs) um different outlets and stuff and interact with us if, if you're feeling into it and um thank you for the people who have you know been reaching out leaving more comments uh we've been having a lot of fun so thank you